But if you could turn your, your Bible to Mark 9. Mark, Mark chapter 9, verse 23. Jesus said to him, if you could believe all things are possible to whom who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And this portion of scripture has marked my heart and my life the last few months. And God did something in me, and I know that it was for this moment because I had no idea that I'd be sharing this morning. But if you, if you start from verse 14, you're just like, whoa, whoa. This is a transitional moment. This is a moment where the disciples need to cross over. They were in this moment where Jesus was telling them, I'm about to be I'm about to die. I'm about to be rejected. I'm about to be beaten to death, but I'm going to rise in three days. But they could not perceive what the Lord was doing. And so they were distracted. They were distracted by how is this going to work? How is this going to happen? Have you ever felt like that? Like you're just, you're just, you're not trying to be real, but you're trying to be like, well, you know, I have to be logical and intellectual because it needs to make sense because how many sometimes feel like you're the Holy Spirit's helper? And I feel like the disciples, especially Peter, you can always take a temperature of where the condition of the disciples are by what Peter, Peter always said. He rebuked Jesus when Jesus told him, I'm about to die and resurrect. He says, no, you're not going to do that. And Jesus rebuked him and said, get behind me, Satan. You're not mindful of the things above. You're, 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 you're living in ignorance. You're not perceiving what's happening in this moment. So Jesus takes James, Peter, and John to where he was about to get transfigured. And because he wanted to show them, like, I, I want to show you my glory. I, I want you to be a man and a, a man that is in tune and, and understanding that I, I'm telling you these things not to put fear in you or, or, or make you indifferent, but that you could begin to pray and ask, help me to perceive the very thing that you're doing. So they come down the mountain. And they walk into this scene where the rest of the disciples were trying to heal a young boy that had been oppressed for a long time. Then you had the scribes who were contentious. You had a desperate father, a sick son. And then you had the distracted disciples. They were distracted by what they felt. They were distracted by what they saw. They were, it was just a chaotic moment. It was like a hot mess. And here Peter was, he just... He just got revelation that Jesus is who he says he is. And he would always ask him, who do you say that I am? Because he wanted them to confess it. They wanted, he wanted to make sure, like, you're with me. You come to church on Sunday. You come to church on Wednesday. Do you believe that I'm for you, I'm with you, and I have destiny over your life? He wanted them to understand, but the disciples were so full of I don't want you to die, but they didn't understand that the cross wasn't the end. It was the access. It was their destiny. It was their promise. It was their future. But they thought that it, it was going to be the end of them, but it was the beginning of them. But they couldn't perceive it. So here they are in this chaotic moment, and Jesus steps on the scene, and he says, what's happening? What, what's happening? And the father comes, and he says, I've been, I've been asking your disciples to heal my son, but, but they couldn't do it. And then there's the scribes, the Pharisees, the religious leaders. Like, yeah, they just, they don't, they don't got it. They don't got it. They, you, you gave, you told them that they were anointed. You already told them I was there when you anointed them. And you told them that they have what it takes to live in this day, in this hour, to walk with dominion, power, and authority. And the scribes were just these haters that never, never, they just had a lot to say but said nothing. Do you know those people? They're just like, what are you saying? Like, just, just do it right that's that's how the scribes and these religious leaders were but Jesus began to just get just I don't I, I don't think he was like oh my god I'm sick of you because he rebukes him and he tells them right there in verse verse 19 he says oh faithless generation how long shall I be with you how long shall I bear with you bring him to me I don't think it was like him being 
like, get out of my face. That's just not Jesus' nature. Like, he was just like, I have four different generations in this mix right here. And this young boy needs a miracle. And God was putting a demand on these men to operate in their God-given anointing, in their God-given promise, in their God-given power. And they couldn't do it because there was unbelief and distraction and confusion allowed in that circle. But Jesus says, bring them to me. So the condition of where they were at was that these men, God was trying to, trying to get them to cross over. Trying to get them to understand that we're, it's time to move forward now. It's time to step into it now. We have prayed it. We have asked for it. But I got a good word for you. It's here. And all you have to do is open your hands and say, I receive it. It's not really complicated. I'm not, I'm not going to say the sister's name, but she, has a, she had a desire to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so on Tuesday night, because I want you to know, women got baptized at our last discipleship. Women got saved, redeemed, healed. It, it, it hits all walks of life. It doesn't matter who you are. They are anointed. I thank God for our leader. And she, she desired to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so I went and grabbed her and I said, do you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? You, you, you have a right as a daughter. You are not a slave nor an orphan. It's not just for the few. It's for you. So I said, okay. She said, okay. And I was like, no, we're, you're going to, you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit and you want to have evidence of speaking in tongues. It's here for you right now. We've been in revival and a lot of times say, yeah, I'm in revival, but you have to participate. You got to open your hand. You got you to gotta do a new praise. You got to do things that you've never done before. I know we're in the house of God, but sometimes you got to. I know, and I, I, I've been in the back because of my daughter, but Diane's in nursery now. She's, she's jumped in. She's two services, and God's growing her capacity. But Zion, you got this. And so I said, come to the altar. And I said, are you ready? Because God is here, and he, we don't have to beg for it. All you got to do is open up your hands, open up your heart, and say, I received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so she did that, and I said, start opening your mouth. And then maybe it start, ah, ba ba ah, ba ba It might, might be weird for those that are new, but, but you know what? We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so she was like, I, I was like, start saying, ah, ba ba God's going to give you an utterance right now because you're his daughter. And the last days he will pour out his spirit. That is for us. That is for me and you. He, it is, it, he is in, we're in a season. We're in a moment. We're under the cloud. And you know what God is saying? You don't have to beg for it. All you got to do is open up your heart, your mouth, and receive it. And she began to say, ah, ba 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 And then the Holy Spirit began to give her an utterance. She was baptized in the Holy Spirit. On a Tuesday night. Tell me that's not revival. And so the, these men, the, the, their condition was, was God was trying to do something new in their life. And I want you to know one of the tactics of the enemy is ignorance. The, Paul says don't be ignorant of the enemy's his schemes, his devices. Because he'll take advantage of you. In this moment, God was trying to enlarge their mind. And it's so crucial for us to be men and women that, that are weaponized. I thank God for this house because we stand on sound doctrine. We are men and women that are balanced in the word. And we, we are not easily con conformed or convinced. We know who we are. But these men, they had to make a decision. So Jesus was concerned for them. And he wanted them to understand, I'm trying to move you forward to cross you over into your destiny. And I want you to grow so that you could be everything that I called you to be. And so the enemy wants us to be men and women. When, about, when that's about to happen, the enemy will come in and try to discourage us, make us worry, paralyze us, distract us, create diversions to hinder and weaken our faith. But we need to know that we are men and women that God is putting a demand on our faith and our anointing. What these disciples failed to understand is that, that there are going to be situations and moments where God is going to put a demand on your oil. 
And we can't be men and women that are off caught guard when you're with your family and when you're at work and you're in different positions and places. Wherever your sphere of influence is at, the Lord is going to put a demand on your anointing. I know we hear a lot of, God, I, my faith is putting a demand on heaven. But I want you to know, VOS San Di Victory Outreach San Diego, that God is putting a demand on our faith and our oil and our anointing. Why? Because it's going to be us, not here, but out there that we're going to bring people to this house because of our anointing, because we lead someone at work or wherever you're at that God wants to anoint you for. Seasons change. Things happen. But God has, has put a demand on our anointing. I, I remember last year, you know, I went through a, a, just a few different things. Um, my dad got cancer and, you know, and it was, all, it was stage two. It was caught before anything. And I remember God speaking to me and saying, I put a demand on your anointing. You, 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 you joined the remnant on Monday nights when Sister Georgina started it. Not get midnight. You, you know our church, our church birthed that. And I remember it saying, because you build a hedge, because you, you allowed me put a, to put in a, a demand on your anointing, not did you have to pray in crisis for a miracle, but you build a hedge around your father because I, you allowed me to put a demand on your prayer life, on your oil, on your life. And I said, that's, that's so heavy, God, because sometimes we want just to put a demand on you. But something was in transition with the disciples. They were going from, Lord, I demand you to heal. And God say, no, I now demand you to heal and you to operate in your giftings. Why? Because sometimes we pray for oil just when we get opportunity. But but God is asking us to be men and women that have oil no matter where we are. Because you could be in any place at any given time. And then suddenly the anointing just falls on you. And you pray for someone at Target or Walmart. Or you pray for your family member. Or you pray for your loved ones. And all of a sudden, God anoints you for that moment. The disciples had missed that. They had missed that. Because they were so distracted by what wasn't that they didn't understand. It was already in them. And you know what God wants me to share with you? It's already in you. It's already in you. It's already in you. The kingdom of heaven is already in you. What he's looking for is partnership. What he's looking for men and women to go out there. We are urban missionaries. We, we, are, we are called to take our city. You might not go to the foreign field. I am not going to the foreign field. I know my calling. But I felt that at this conference that God sent me to my city. That God sent me to my workplace. That God sent me to every place that God has called me to, to, to be. I felt like I'm, I mean, I'm taking my city. People ask me. Where, where are you going? I'm going to San Diego. I, I, like I felt like, no, I, I'm, I'm confident in this, that God sent me to my city. God has sent me to my family. God has sent me to my workplace. God has sent me. I, I've been sent and commissioned by the Holy Spirit to go wherever I am connected to to bring God's healing. And I love that Jesus said, I'll do greater things through you. We're called to raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out demons, not get strange. Not be strange fire, but, but be men and women that know and operate under our anointing. Their condition was key. But you know what? Their confession was also key. You know, the, the father, Jesus asked him, how long has your son been like this? How long has this been going on? Jesus knows all the answers. He knew, he knew that this young boy had been oppressed for all these years, but he wanted him to confess it, to renounce it. He wanted him to go from not knowing to having a self-awareness and understanding that when you begin to confess it, you break agreement with anything, maybe yourself, maybe the enemy. Sometimes we blame the enemy for anything. It could just be our flesh that we agree with that creates a stronghold. Anything you believe becomes a stronghold. Whether it's a spiritual or whether it's a world, whatever it is, a carnal becomes a stronghold. And Jesus, the minute that he said that, something happened in the supernatural. It doesn't relinquish responsibility. Confession does not relinquish responsibility. Some people are like, I confess, now everything is be good. No, no. You confess, now God breaks in the realms of the spirit. Now God endows you with a supernatural ability 
to begin to go from I can't to I can, to feeling there's no way out, to feeling I got hope, to feeling I don't got a word, to I got a word, and now I can wage good warfare. So the minute that he confessed, he realized that Jesus was putting a demand on his faith. And so what he did is said, I believe, but help my unbelief. It wasn't a, a prayer of, of, of God condemning him and saying, you don't got enough faith. It was him saying, I want you to grow. I, he realized, like, I got to grow. And that's such a beautiful place to be when you pray, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. And he, when he confessed it, he broke something, and he was able to say, I'm ready now. I'm ready now. I was blaming all these things why my son could not get a breakthrough. But now I understand that I am your partner. Now I understand that you don't want to do it for me, but you now want to do it through me. I am now your partner. Now I understand it's my faith through your name that I'm able to take my son's healing and put it on him. And that's the beautiful thing about confession is that God wants us to break things by the things that we say so that we can say, God, I want you to use me the way that you want to use me. Is this making sense to anybody this morning? Because I feel like this, God wants us to be women, men, men and women that know how to confess things and so that we can get strengthened. It was their confession that was key. He told them, bring the son to me. Now the son came to him. It was the condition, it was his confession, but it was also the command that Jesus had. It was the command. And I love that, you know, when you think about prayer, you, you think of Jesus literally said, I command this spirit to enter no more. When you think about prayer you, and you develop, because it's, prayer is a mystery. The disciples asked Jesus, how do I pray? Because it's... We continuously learn how to pray as we're connected to the vine. But you know that I, I've been asking the Lord that. And he said, Lord, you know, why would Jesus, omnipotent, all-powerful, omnipresent, why would he need us to pray? Especially when he says, pray to me, the Lord of the harvest, that I would send laborers. Why, would, why can't you just send laborers? Why can't you just heal? Why do you need me? Why, why can't you just do it? But that's the mystery of prayer. He cannot do anything in the realm of human redemption without a man and a woman that will partner with him through faith. That is his system. Because he can easily do it. But he wants us to agree with him. So seasons in my life where I've begged God, now I agree with God. Because when you know his will, you, you pray differently. When you, when you're, you have the word in you, you don't say, Lord, please heal. Please do this for me. No, you say, according to your word and the cross, you shed your blood on Calvary. It was 39 times that you were beaten, and every time you released the healing virtue. So I command the cross to activate in my body and my family. He was teaching them. But you can only pray that when you're in clear conscience. And you're in right standing with the Lord. So prayer gets addicting when you understand the will. When, you're, when you don't understand the will of Father, because our job is to carry out the will. It's to carry out the answers. To carry out the promise. We're, we're here to agree with God's will. And I read something that just, that just made me feel like, oh, I, I see. He was saying that we, God's promises are like a check. And those that work in corporations, two people need to sign a check. And he was saying, God signed it by his blood. He already did his part. It was already finished at the cross. You don't need to ask God to heal, save, and deliver. It was already finished at the cross. It is now our access as co-signers to sign the check in agreement for the check to be valid. And a lot of people say, oh, Lord, please, God won't. But I am here to tell you it is time to cross over. If you know your word, you know his will. So the word gets addicting because now you know his will. So now you be like, I command that now. And you don't relinquish responsibility, but it releases a supernatural ability for you to carry it out. To you to walk in places, in territory, and say, I belong here. You go from an insecure place to a boldness that only the fire of heaven can release in your life. It becomes addicting. Because we 
we are co-signers. We are hearers. We are God's promise to carry out his will to the nation. You have it inside of you. Sometimes we separate ourselves and we say that's for them, that's for her. I want you to know if you are saved, if you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it is your kingdom right. It is your kingdom right. It is your legal right. Your legal right to take every promise and know his will and take every promise. We are moving from if to say no, it is. That's our promise and I believe as a church imagine imagine if we all carried ourselves like that not self-righteous but in in a holy ghost confidence spirit filled filled with the will filled with the power you're gonna walk into to prominent places and you're gonna say I command that to come I command that to go thy will be done thy kingdom come here and now you just pray different you almost feel like you just you just get a you just feel bad. You're just like, yeah, heaven's behind me. And I know the word. I know his will. I don't, I don't need to apologize. I don't need to ask for access. I know that if I carry the anointing and the oil, I can walk in it. We are crossing over from asking to knowing to being so that we can be carriers of what he wants to use us for. He wants to use you when you're at home. He wants to use you when you're in your workplace. He wants to use you when you're serving in this house. You don't, you don't got to ask to be anointed. You are anointed. If you're cultivating the, the word and you're disciplining yourself, you are anointed to preach the gospel, to set the captives free. I believe that with all of my heart. So here Jesus did. He heals his son. And now the disciples asked him, why couldn't we do it? Why couldn't we do it? And Jesus says, because some things only come out with prayer and fasting. And I feel like they, they were trying to understand in the natural realm what Jesus could only do in the spiritual realm. They weren't understanding that the resurrection was their destiny. That the resurrection was going to be bigger than just them 12. But it was going to go to the four corners of the world. That the cross spoke for me and you here and now. Isn't that beautiful? And so they went from a carnal, a carnality place to a supernatural place. And like, it's not that complicated. They, they were trying to complicate it. They're like, we can't do this. We don't have what it takes. I, I, Jesus is going to be gone. What are we gonna? They were tripping and worried for, for what? And then the moment they needed their oil, they had none. But I believe this is that Jesus is saying, don't make it complicated. If you're in the word and you're in prayer and you're under a covering, you won't get strange. You won't get weird. What you'll do is you'll compliment the house. You'll compliment the vision. You'll walk. You'll bring people. It's simple. We're called to heal the sick. We're called to raise the dead. We're here to set the captive free. It's simple. And it's for me and you. It's not for the select few. It's for me and you. And I pray, church, that we catch that this morning. You are anointed. You are anointed. I've had some of my best encounters at my workplace. I've prayed for my coworkers. I've led people to the Lord. I've had a moment with my boss where she's come to knock at midnight. And she was saying, I'm believing for my husband. I said, you know where I pray for my husband? Knock at midnight. She's like, what's that? Well, it's all these 200 plus women all over the world. And we all pray for our husbands. And they wake up on Tuesday and they have pep in their step. <laughs> and... And so I said, Lord, I, I'm not looking. I, my, my mission field is wherever I'm at. God is saying, I'm here to use your life. You are called by God. And sometimes we eliminate ourselves. We said, that's for them. That's for, that's for you. Imagine if all of us, if all of us together activate our oil. Oh, the places will go in this city. The territories will reach in this city. We'll have business leaders. We'll have drug addicts come to this house. Be set free in just one moment. And Jesus was teaching that. If the pianoists can play and if we can stand. God is putting a demand on our life. More than ever. More than ever. Sometimes we go through situations, some might be self-inflicted, but there are some that God will just put a demand on your life, a demand for the oil. 
I remember, you know, a year and a half ago, you guys all know my story, our miracle child, Zion. But I remember in that season going through all these procedures and medical um, things that I had to go through. And I remember saying, God, I don't want to not be in the know. Because the anointing teaches us all things. Like he's, what happened with the disciples is they had no perception. They could not perceive what the Lord was doing. So they were walking in ignorance. That's one of the greatest tactics of the enemy is ignorance. Paul says it. Put on the full armor so that you can stand against the vials of the enemy. You know what that word vials in the Greek means is that the enemy has one device, one road. That's to your mind. And I remember being, and I'm, I'm not, like I, I, I'm very independent, very independent, and I'm very confrontational. I think that's because I grew up in Big Church. I might not come from drugs, but when you grow up in the women's home, in the men's home, sometimes I'm like, did I? <laughs> Because you, you just, you see so many different things. But I remember being in the season where not only did I feel barren physically, I felt barren spiritually. I remember being in this really, really dark place. And I said, God, I, I refuse to walk depressed because that's not of you. I refuse to feel like there's no way out because that's not of you. There are things that you will call us to carry as our cross. But Lord, I refuse to put it to man. God said, I'm putting demand on your faith. And I was like, yes. I said, Lord, you're putting to man, not only my birthing Zion, but I'm birthing a new realm of faith. There are things where things, sometimes we use our situation to set us back. But I pray, some of you that have seen me, my comeback has been strong. Because I feel like I birthed a new gen. God birthed a new gen in that season of feeling alone and, and feeling barren. It's, 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 but, but I remember Sister Georgina prayed over me. I was, I was on the stage. And she said, God's going to use you to give life. God's going to use you physically and spiritually. And I said, God put a demand on my life. You're anointing. The, the things that you go through is now the, the place that God wants to use you for. The place, the attack, the, the affliction, the, the lack, whatever it might be. It's now your anointing. Because you know what it is to endure. And you know what it is to feel it and go through it. But, but God put a demand on your anointing. Every one of us is anointed for the things that we've been through. Now I feel like I have, I have a new, new life in me because God put a demand on it. And I believe this is that God is putting a demand on our oil and our faith. And that God wants us to perceive it as you lift your hands in this moment. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, because you've called our whole entire church to be anointed. You've called every single one of, one, one of our members to be filled with oil and be baptized in the Spirit. It's not for the few. It's for every man and woman that's in this house. You want to anoint some men and women. What you're going to do is, is take off the scales, the ignorance that the enemy wants to use. And now you're going to say, Lord, Lord, I perceive what you're doing. You're putting a demand on my life. You want to use me wherever I go. I'm going to heal the sick. I'm going to raise the dead. I'm going to set the captives free. It's not just for leaders. It's for every believer in this house. If that's you and you feel like, God, I'm crossing over. God, I'm stepping in to what you have for me. I want to invite you to this altar.